es un placer. It really, truly is a pleasure to, to present a, a not only a colleague in this um, fight against this epidemic, but also um, un tocayo, un catracho también, ¿no? Ambos del mismo país, ambos hondureños. Y pues Neri Díaz is a bilingual. It's truly an honor, right? Because it's like someone from your own country, so I really feel proud to be introducing him. And so Neri Díaz is a bilingual and bicultural licensed independent clinical social worker in ADCT with 19 years of experience working with the Latino community. He is currently a mental health therapist at La Clinica and has been an activist bringing awareness about his culture, our culture, yeah. <laughs> his people, struggles, and most recently, he has been using the power of la palabra, or the word, through poetry. Please put your hands together in welcoming Neri Díaz. Gracias. That's good? Okay. Gracias. Uh, gracias por la introducción, este, mi amigo Alejandro. Este, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, well, you already said my name. My name is Neri. Uh, I prefer to go by Neri, uh, even though I have a long name. So Neri is my first name. Um, you already say where I'm from. I'm from Honduras, Central America. I, I'll tell you a little bit about who I am, and then I'll go and talk about uh, how to, you know, get into the Latino community. How do we reach into the Latino community? Uh, prefer I don't use the term Latino uh, personally. I don't go by the term, so it's kind of like weird. I'm using Latino to describe my community, but I don't call myself Latino. I go by Honduras. I was born in a small little town in Honduras. I come from the mountains. Um, my family are come from poverty. Uh, my grandfather, who died a couple years ago, he's 113 years old. When he died, and um, he's a native indigenous man. I'm proud to be indigenous man from this land, from the land of Central America. Um, that's why when you throw me the label Latino, you basically erasing who I am as a person. Basically, you give me a label, then it's not describe me as a, the person I was brought up as a child. So uh, no, no offense, but that's, you know, whoever wants to call Latino, Hispano, hey, more power to you, my brother or my sisters. But me, I'm, I was born there. My family was uh, land workers. Uh, they worked the land. Um, my grandfather didn't know how to read or write. My father, too, and my uncles, too, my aunts, too. So all my family come from a very uh, low social status. Um, and being in my town and being raised the way I was raised, uh, listening to the oral traditional, but also being who uh, we were as a person, we also face a lot of discrimination because that's the truth. Uh, sometimes we, as a community, we don't want to talk about our, uh, our own oppression that we face in our own countries, in our own places. So social, sta social status uh, is a big issue, and I'm going to refer to Latin America. So the higher the social status you are or the lighter you are, the more opportunity you get. And that's the reality. So we know that the education and everything, how it has been set up, the structure, the way it has been set up, it has been to oppress our people and oppress indigenous people all over America. So um, coming to this land as a 18 year old and coming to Minnesota, I came to Minnesota, my father crossed the border like many my my my, my community members. Um, we experience similar, we are very, you know, similar experience. Uh, you are Mexicano, or Centro Americano, or Sur Americano. Este, son la misma experiencia. So, and the most of the community that we serve, I'm not saying I don't want to generalize, I'm not saying everyone, but we tend to serve a community that who are um, not well educated. So, and sometimes we are providing services to our community with a low education. Some, uh, some of uh, my colleagues mentioned it, you know, uh, didn't know how to read or write. So how do we serve someone who doesn't know how to read or write? Yeah, how do we do that? If you are a Latino who know the language, who is, you know, understand, read Spanish very well and write it very well, speak English, and you read English and you do that, and all of a sudden you have a title. So now you are in, in, in the position of power. Because we are, we do, we, get, we have power. Uh, power to, we can use it or abuse it or not use it at all. Many times that happens. You know, I mean, uh, it's the truth. Um, if you have a 
documents, your legal status, all the sum, you're better than your, you know, uh, paisano, your next uh, catracho or, you know, Mexican, you're better than that. So now you're already, you know, thinking better than the rest of your brothers and your sisters. And that's already creating division among our community already. So the higher you go, and you become resident, well now, you're really better than the rest. So that's how our mentality tend to work, and that's how we tend to, we describe success in different ways. And for success for everybody is different, for me it's different. For me, I'm, I always wanna be true to who I am. I always wanted to be true to my people, and always true, be true to, because if I'm not true to myself, and I ain't true to my community, then I'm losing. I start losing who I am. Then I start losing connection with my people. That's why when I decided to go to school and everything uh, in Sinclair, Minnesota, came in 1990 there, I went to a, a school where mainly um, 1,500 were uh, Caucasians. I was like the two, three brown, light brown people, two African Americans, uh, maybe a couple Native Americans. And uh, growing up in there, you face a, a lot of discrimination. So one of the things I told myself was, I needed to be proud of who I am. I needed to be proud of who, where I come from. And I also I need to maintain who I am because identity is, is a huge part of my personal success, which is not money, it's not education, because education doesn't define who I am. It's just a paper that helped me open doors for my community. The moment I think as a, I'm better than so-and-so, guess what? I'm losing that connection with my community. So where am I going here? <coughs> where am I going is to, in order to, to, to work with our communities, first we need to really understand where they're coming from. Do they come from cities? Are they come from a small town? What is their education level? Uh, who they are as a person, okay? As a person, not as someone in, uh, who has substance use disorder or someone who has a mental health disorder. Uh, because we tend to treat people Oh, you know, it's alcoholic. Oh, a drug alcoholic. Uh, you do other drugs. Uh, you're an addict. So we, you know, that's the mentality. Uh, you're an addict. And we, as a profession, we tend to be better than them because we are healthy. We have a profession. We have a, you know, good job. Blah 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 blah. blah which, in reality, we are better than nobody. We're just another human being. <laughs> you know, I'm in recovery myself. I was. I did use for almost nine years. I tried many things. Um, uh, as a person who was used, who used to use, I know what is the shame that we get as a using. And uh, it's not just the shame that we get, but also it's the trust. Our family, your community, lose trust on yourself. All of a sudden they don't believe in you. Okay, so that's a barrier already in inside our, our, own, our own family, because that's the truth, you know? I mean, if you're alcoholic, that's all right. Uh, marihuanero, oh, addicto, eres an addict, you know, or oh, cocaine, oh, an addict. And the highest goal level goes high, and the stigma goes high, and the trust among, you know, your, your own family is, is lost. And that's how it is in our community, too. You know, it becomes very isolated. And all of a sudden, you find yourself living in a country where you are undocumented, or you don't have the right documentation, or you don't know the language, or you don't even know how to write or speak Spanish very well, or whatever language, because I know our brothers and sisters from my, our land, they speak other languages, not just Spanish, they speak Maya, uh, Nahua, uh, or in indigenous languages. So even then, then what do we do? How do we reach to them? How do we connect with them? Is we using terminology, uh, medical terminology, or we using this terminology as a substance use, or we using this professional terminology? How do we really reach into them? How do we get their trust? How do we get them to talk about it? How do we get them to open up to you and tell you, Neri, no, no tengo documento. I am documented. Neri, I'm here by myself. I'm alone. Or tell you about their trauma. How do you open that? How do you get them? I think that's the part for me as, as a human being, as a person, I try to be as humble as I can when I come to work with my community. I come across as like, I'm just netty. Don't give me no titles, because titles to me, I hate them. I do, I hate them. Because then, I, the moment I start using them, then I'm putting a barrier. I'm putting a wall between that person and myself. And to me, that's not gonna be successful. So when I do mental health, when I do treatment, 
I, my approach is always about building the relationship. It's about me treating the person as a human being. Me being interested in knowing where the person comes from. Because I don't know everything. I cannot speak for, for every person from Mexico the down here, or even from the United States, or you know, even Alaska, because we got brothers and sisters being born in Alaska too. Uh, how, do we, how, do I, how do I talk to them? How do I connect with them? How do we do that? I mean, a lot of people, there's a lot of evidence-based uh, information there. Uh, knowing the language, it helps. Yeah, it does. Uh, you know, knowing a little bit about the community, about the, the, the values and we, that we have, it, it does help. It does help. Um, so there is so, so all these things does help, but when it comes to do the work, when it comes to do all that, you know, it's so important to, to be also consistent with our people. I remember when I used to do outreach, uh, HIV, I started as an outreach worker working in the, uh, with my community. And I used to go to different places uh, where a lot of high risk uh, situations were happening. I say situation because there was a lot of situ high risk situations, uh, you know, dealing drugs, uh, bars, uh, prostitution, all of that. And how do I connect it with my community? And I, I remember when I was start my job, and I was like, they, did they give me this um, title? And I was like, okay, you know, I want to change the world. I want to do this. This is what I, I've been wanting to. And um, Six months went by, and I always like, wow, this is tough, you know. Work, talking about HIV, talking about AIDS, talking about uh, all this sexual uh, uh, stigma in our community. Because even sex for us is really hard to talk about us. Even sex, I mean, seriously. My dad never talked to me about sex. Anybody never talked to me about sex. So even so, here as a young man trying to talk to uh, talk to people about sex and then talk about their you know preference and what they do, how they do, and all of that. It was really challenged, and I was like, "How am I going to do this work?" I wanted to just quit and say, "Hey, this is not for me." But <laughs> I was like, "That this is not for me." But I learned so much because I, cons you know, I started working in. I went like underground, and I went to places where my community always is, um, spend time. I spent time a lot of time where they spend. I have to just go there and just carry my little bag. And I introduce myself, and I uh, never introduce myself as a professional, like, like I'm doing this. Uh, you know, and I start talking to them, and talking to them, and talking to them. Uh, I almost got beat up one time. <laughs> but it was good. I was like, no, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm going to come back. And it, you know, it's just being consistent with our community. And when you say you're going to do something, do it. Do it. Don't promise, OK? I remember one time uh, this family called me, um, had this, built this relationship with this uh, leader. It's a, a lady, I don't remember the name. She's like, Neri, I want you to come to my house and do testing. I'm like, man, am I allowed? Am I going to tell clues that I can do this? I'm like, no, I'm not telling clues I'm doing this, but I'm going. Hey, they're paying me to get test people. I'm testing people. And I went there, and she had like, dang, you know, people and, you know, high risk guys. And I was like, and, you know, they were like, but, wow, but I cannot do it over here in front of everybody. you got to give me a place where I can do it. Oh, no, don't worry. We have a room over here. You just, you know, come and sit down, do, do what you do. And, but that's the work you do. That's the work, you know, being consistent, being present, being, you know, building the relationships with the person, with the people, with the community, being you. For me, that's how I, you know, reach to my community. So that's when somebody asked me, do you have a PowerPoint? I say, Daniela, no, I ain't organic. I ain't a natural born. <laughs> I'm not going to do, no. No, I'm not going to do. I mean, no, no offense to my, my colleagues, my respect, I'm serious, <laughs> and I love them. But to me, I, you know, it's just what I do, so um, definitely. But, you know, everything has been great. Everything has been really great because I think this is the beginning for us to start talking about a topic that is really hard in our community. Um, you know, even to this day, is. When I disclose my, 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 my addict part of my life, uh, people get like, oh my God. I, like, I don't do it with a, with a sense of people feeling sorry for me. I don't want people to feel sorry for me. Really, I hate that. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. I'm, using, I'm using myself as a tool. Okay? That's how I see myself. Creator created me for a reason. All these things that happen in my life, uh, all the trauma that we experience as a people, um, all this journey, then we come to all the way to this land. I experience a lot of that, and that to me is a blessing. 
I'm not saying that I want everybody to go through what I went through. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, but I don't, I don't want people to feel sorry for me. No, because our community, our liberal community, it's, it's my story is somebody's story or so somebody else's story. I see the similarity in my community from trauma, uh, violence trauma. We're experiencing that right now, and we experienced it for mo more than 500 years. Uh, sexual abuse, we experienced that in home and the family and the community. That's reality. We're experiencing people being killed in front of us. That's a reality. Guess what? That's the reality. That's why we're coming here. That's why we're escaping. And there's no other reason why we want to come here. I mean, for me, is I had a suite at home? Is I have what I wanted and what I needed as a young man, as a kid? Sir God, I wouldn't be here. Now we're here. And now what? Now we have these issues going on in our communities. Now we're showing what we have been through. Because to me, addiction was just a part of showing what I have been through. It was a behavior. It was a way for me to you know, numb myself. That's what I did it. I did it because I numbed the pain I had in me. You know, being you know, discriminated, being pushed around, being telling me you know, bad jokes, like go back to Mexico, which I love my people from Mexico. But I was like, but I cannot go back to Mexico. I'm not from Mexico. I'm like, I'm telling them, I'm like, not Mexican. I'm Honduran. I was born in Central America. And they didn't get it, you know. Even my brother from Laos and Vietnam, they call Omex. They call me Omex, which means Mexican. I was like, why are you calling me Omex? Are you, you know, Mexican. No, man, no Mexican. I, I did it like, no Mexican, man. I'm Central America. But we are brothers and sisters, and now I get it. But, uh, um, and that's the reality. That's the experience of many of our people. Many of the people who are doing the work, the hard work, the hard labor here, the ones who are working in the farms, picking up the you know, our vegetables, our food, and everything. A lot of our, my people are doing that. A lot of Guatemalans, a lot of brothers and sisters from Guatemala, Mexico, doing this work. So how do we serve them? Yes, the language helps. But some of them don't speak Spanish, though. No. I remember doing it the other day. A uh, colleague of mine asked me, hey, Neri, come and do a Rule 25 for this gentleman. And I was like, yeah, 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 man. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be there. I'll be there. I said to her, I I'm willing to help her. I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. Two hours doing this Rule 25. And I was like, what, what, what's going on? He, he can, how come he doesn't understand me? And I was like, something's going on with here. I, am I losing something? Am I, what's going on? I was like telling myself, did he have some, I was like, learning disability or, you know. Well, all the time he told me, no, I said, you know, um, through talk about what I do in the community, like I do, I'm an Aztec dancer, even though I'm not Mexican, I do Aztec dance, you know. So, weird. so I started telling him, you know, I do Aztec dance and I work with the you know, community doing this work. And he's like, oh yeah, my father, uh, yeah, my father, my father is involved in stuff like that. And I was like, oh, really cool. I said, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know, it's hard because I don't speak Spanish. I, my first language is Nahua. So he grew up speaking Nahua. Here in the United States at 14, 14, 15 years old, they labeled him as a, he had a learning disability. Guess what? Spanish was not his first language. It's not his first language. So he's speaking Nahua. And here I'm wondering like, why this guy, why can I get this assessment done in God, would I get it done in an hour and a half or two hours? <laughs> Duh. Uh -huh. Well, that's why. I needed to speak different way. I needed to break it down. And I was breaking the questions, you know, because I was translating from English mentally to Spanish. And from Spanish, I need to break it down to more, you know, simple way. I, a lot of times, I had to do explanation. A lot of times, I had to do education. What it means. You know, se toma dos cervezas. Cuantas. How many, how many beers do you drink? Or how many? Is it three, four, five? Do you do it every day? And I was like breaking down all these questions in a simple way. And yes, so that's how do we, you know, we need to really learn about the person. Because if I would, if I would have known that, and he speak you know, now, which probably I would have, you know, prepared myself and say, hey, you know what? We need at least three hours because I would need more time for me to educate the person. So I was doing education while I was doing an assessment. That's what we do. So imagine this person going to a place where you got an hour and a half, and you got to get paid an hour and a half, and you know what? Time is money in this country, sadly, but that's how it works. In our culture, time is time. <laughs> Syria, time is time. We don't care about time. Shoot, time is time. <laughs> so, so we as a professionals and, and working for agencies where they are like, you know, telling us, hey, you got to hurry up. You got to see, 
So many clients, six, seven, eight, because that's the number. So it's always thinking about the number, you know? And it's not about the quality of services that we're doing. Guess what, if we don't do quality of services, if we don't provide good services, what are we gonna do? What do we do? We lose people. We lose that person. I remember uh, when I was in college, studying psychology, uh, my advisor said, hey, Nettie, you know what? Come and do support that master level and be a, um, a client for them and do therapy. And I went, I was like, what the hell, therapy? I didn't believe in that, no? <laughs> <laughs> like, man, when I have a problem, I go to my family, you know? <laughs> so I was like, well, we're gonna give you extra credit. I'm like, oh, extra credit, sure, yeah, I, I'm, I'm there. I was like, come on, oh, I went. So this person spoke Spanish and he was, you know, she was, she was doing good. Now I regret it. Now I feel guilty, you know, what I did. And she's like, and no offense to anybody from Costa Rica here, okay? Uh, no, no offense, my brothers and sisters, I'm sorry. She is like, so what part of Costa Rica are you from? I was like, what? Yeah. No, 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 I said, I'm not Costa Rican. I was like, are you Costa Rican? <laughs> I was like, oh my God, here I am. I was like, I'm coming for therapy. I am supposed to disclose to this person my issues, which I had not disclosed to nobody <laughs> because they were mine. And I was like, are you serious? I was like, oh, I'm a Costa Rican. And I went off on her, and that's what I regretted. I said, don't ever call me Costa Rican, I said. <laughs> and she's like, but what did I do wrong? I was trying to connect with, with him. That's what my advisor told me later on, because I said, you know what, I said, you're not gonna have me here anymore. You won't see me again anymore. I won't come back again, I said. So I left, I was so angry. I was like, so mo I was more, more mad. And what happened is historically, Costa Ricans and Hondurans, there is an issue happened to us. One of our leaders, Francisco Morazan from Honduras was killed when he was trying to get Central America to be one nation. And the person who sold him was from Costa Rica. Guess what? I carry that inside of me, that, histor that history, that proud, that pride of being who I am, that, the pride like we wanted to be one nation. Imagine Central America being one nation, you know? I mean, God, imagine that, what would we be right now? No borders for us, less borders for me. <laughs> do you know? <laughs> Shoot, yeah. <laughs> I still, I, I'm able to do that when I go home. There's no border between me and Salvador and Guatemala. I go across and I say, hey, I'm from, I didn't even say, I just crashed the border. But what I'm saying is, you know, she, she didn't understand the history, context, what has happened to our people. She wanted to connect, and she, and she, didn't, she meant well. I mean, she did meant well, and, but she didn't know that history. She didn't know my history. She didn't know the division that sometimes we have. And to me, to this day, I have to work around that too, because I have to, you know, it happens in the past, it's in the past. You know, um, but sometimes I look at it well, like maybe Central America would be better, you know. Um, so little things like that, sometimes we can lose a person. And sometimes we don't even know. We wonder why they don't, why they don't come back anymore. You know, I mean, we, are ling we have a culture, we have linguistic, we have, you know, we serve the Latino community and we, you know, call ourselves number one or whatever. But we really, we don't understand why the person didn't come back. We didn't get to know that person. So. I can go on and on. I don't know how much time I have. Oh, I got plenty of time, no? ¿Cuánto tiempo tengo? No quiero aburrirlos. I don't want to uh, bore you guys. Um, I would also like to ask, uh, you know, um, I, I, don't, I feel like I'm talking to uh, people who already know a lot about my community. Um, so if you have questions uh, about what i done, I didn't tell you my, about the work. I told you a little bit about the work i done. Um, to I disclose you my, my uh, part of my addiction too. Um, I, I also disclose that I'm a very proud person. Um, that's my recovery for me, practicing my culture. Pract work? Ah, donde trabajo? Trabajo en un lugar que se llama, used to be called Westside Community Health Services. Uh, now they call it Minnesota Community Care. Um, and uh, I w work pretty much there almost all my life, I think. Because I live, I go to, I work at HCMC, and then I came back, and then I went somewhere, and I came back. I guess I come back to Westside or uh, Minnesota Community Care now 
is because I believe in the work they do. Uh, we serve the underserved population, and I'm one of them. I see myself as one person who is underserved. Um, so working for a place where they're put priority in uh, what to serve our community, uh, we don't we don't ask for documentations. I love that. Even though sometimes when I do, I used to do HIV and uh, stuff like that. I needed to ask, you know, this, you know, where the front. I really hate it. I'm like, do you have a social security number? And working in treatment too, we have to ask for a social security number. Sadly, you know. So I had a, you know, we had to come up with a zero 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 or nine nine nine. What is it, Elizabeth? It's a nine 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 or one of the numbers. No, we give them a number. Nine nine nine. No, nine nine nine. Yo prefiero el siete 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 siete. Just my own preference, no? Let me pick, you know? Because treatment should be that way too, a very individual. You need to be individualized. That's what I'm sharing you, the part about my, how I am in recovery. I don't believe that one a big umbrella or one system is gonna take care of uh, all of us. It, 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 it don't work, sorry, it don't work. It might work for some people, but it cannot work for everybody. Personally, I don't think it works. So, um, so yeah, which they should give me the opportunity to pick up a number. Like, hey, what number you wanna use? You know? So, um, so I work for Minnesota Community Care. So, and I work in the is, uh, school system. I don't work for the school system. I work for the Westside Community or Minnesota Community Care. But I do um, therapy and with youth, sixth grade to 12th grade. I love it. I decided to go back there because I want a mentor. Um, there were some good mentors in my life. I believe in mentoring. Uh, that's why another approach that we got to use, I think, peer educator, that's kind of like a mentor. When you were talking about it, I was like, yeah. So I have mentors who, you know, uh, part of my recovery, also I had a padrino. I call it padrino or madrina. But in my case, it was a padrino, Puerto Rican brother. Um, he was the only one who knew I was, you know, addict. And I called him when I was in recovery, and I said, hey, man, I, I'm, I, I can't do it, man. I can't do it. He's like, no, no, man, come over. Let's play some conga. Never seen a, I've seen a conga, but I never played it, so I was like, okay, sure. Uh, but, you know, he introduced me to, to, to what I'd done in my life, uh, part of it in the beginning in the, of my recovery. He was the, my mentor, and he, I call him my mentor. To this day, we're still friends. So, um, so yeah, so that's what I'm doing. Um, also have a temporary license for addiction because that's my passion, too, uh, because a lot of that the stuff I did, a lot of the behavior that I did was related to my trauma to the trauma that I experienced as a, uh, as a child, as a young man too. Um, so, and we don't, sometimes we don't talk about that. So like I was telling, you know, we numb ourselves. And uh, addiction or using substances for me was that. I wanted to escape. I didn't want to leave this world where I was living. So 24-7, um, the only time I was not high is when I was sleeping. And when I woke up, I was like, I gotta ha get high too because I needed to go back to sleep. I couldn't sleep without it. I mean, I was in that level. I think so, but uh, no, it's, it's, it's been a great journey um, to, be, to be able to, you know, to go through whatever I've been through, and I think how do we serve someone like me, uh, angry young man who in that time, how do you serve someone who has a lot of trauma? How do you serve someone who, um, you know, sees himself as um, native indigenous or uh, come from a low education, you know, level where he had been experiencing a lot of discrimination back in their own country, f maybe we, we from his own people, from his own government? How do we serve that? How do we trust government here too? Some question. I mean, this is real questions. How do we trust right now, especially like my people right now? With we got my many of my ch children from my country are being encaged. How am I gonna come out and say, hey, by the way, I'm an addict, and I need help? Uh, you know, because it's also criminal too. Uh, a lot of my you know my homies, you know, they got legal issues, so. If I open up, it's also, it's a, it's the also the, the risk of you know, being criminalized, which our doctor spoke about, it, you know? I mean, so it's not easy. So think about that, all the barriers. So I'm not gonna talk about all the barriers, but how do we overcome the barriers? How do we help someone to overcome the barriers? How do we tell them it's gonna be okay? You know, I mean, right now I go to prisons right now, I do a Rule 25 and I do mental health and I work with some lawyers and I go to prisons to, you know, to meet someone for two, three hours, and I, tell, I had to get this information. I need this information because that's gonna depend on what is he's gonna be able to get out or she's gonna be able to get out instead of being deported to their country. So I have that two, three hours, and that my, my first thing is about relationship. 
I need to build this relationship with this person. And at first time, I don't even go in to the assessment. I go and talk to the person, you know, like, I don't even pull out my papers. I just talk to them like normal, you know? And I introduce myself like somebody, professional status. I'm gonna do this, I said, but not yet. Let's talk about it. Where are you from? Don't, you know, tell me where you're from. You know, what's your story? Tell me a little bit about you. And I tell them about my life too. Even though in my, you know, in therapy and relationship, they tell us, don't disclose so much about yourself. And which, you know, ethic, you know, we have to follow the ethics rules. So sometimes that's what happens is we lose the, uh, the professional part. We lose the, 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 the identity of who we are as a person. So I try to walk the, the line where I still be me. I'm still me. I'm a human. And I come like that. And I, so that's what helped me to connect with them. And I have two hours to get that information, to get that assessment done, and to get that information that needs to be, you know, sent to somebody. So thank you, Nadia. That was thank you so much. great. Thank you.